I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor uh, Greg Osgood. Just give you the permissions. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, so I will just introduce you quickly and then um, you can start sharing. Um, so Professor Greg Osgood is uh, Chief of Orthopedic Trauma and an Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. His areas of expertise in orthopedic trauma care include fracture non-unions, pelvis and acetabular injuries, routine fractures and surgical infections. Professor Osgood is a former major in the United States Air Force. He completed several combat deployments providing orthopedic trauma care to the US military. He collaborates with the departments of computer science and biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins University on advanced imaging techniques for internal fixation. Dr. Osgood and Professor Nava worked together since 2014 to advance orthopedic education and interventions using augmented reality, advanced C-arm imaging and head-mounted displays for surgery. In collaboration with Professor Jeff Sewardson, Professor Osgood actively participates in, innova in innovative search engineering courses, providing engineers with surgical expertise and knowledge. And we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to be back in Zurich, even if it's uh, virtual. Uh, I was really looking forward to this trip. Uh, I think in person, um, as Dr. Nawab said, the equation of the collaboration between orthopedic surgeons or any surgeons and uh, innovations, innovators is really best when the distance is small. And um, I was really looking forward to it, even for a few days to come out and, and really be present and, and talk to you. I wanna thank everyone here, Matthias and all of the collaborators who have organized this great uh, session for two weeks, it's really an un unusual and unique thing in, in my aspect of medicine in which people can talk and, and work together for that period of time. It's really unheard of. Our, our longest meetings are three or four days. So two weeks is really extraordinary. Anyway, I don't wanna waste the time, my, my, uh, but, but thank you to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and to share my ideas, our experience and where we are going because I think you know, all of us together can, can make a lot more influence on this field than uh, individuals. So my topic today is bringing AR to the OR, and especially in orthopedic trauma, you've seen a lot of great examples of, of how to bring AR and VR, mixed reality, um, facilitated reality to medicine. And it's really amazing how far it's come in such a short amount of time as Dr. Navab chronicled. Uh, I have to give you my background. I'm a orthopedic trauma surgeon, so I operate on most bones except the spine and except the hand. Uh, and these have, the, the spine has been one of the easiest areas to study in some ways and because of the uniformity of the anatomy. And my anatomy is a little bit different in some ways, which you might see going forward. So let's see. So I'll, uh, just my conflicts, I work with Siemens and CareStream. I also work with uh, Depew and uh, DJO. Uh, I do some consulting uh, and I do some editing, but I don't think any of these will have a big impact on what we're discussing. And just to kind of bring this into context, why we're talking about this at all is because uh, surgeries that we used to do 10 or 20 years ago uh, as an open surgery, exposing all of the bone, all of the tissue around and everything we had to interact with to stabilize a fracture, to get it to, to be aligned and healed the, the best way was done in the past as open surgery, we saw everything, we could touch everything, we could, you could hear things, you could see things, you could feel textures um, of, of tissues as we work with them. The fat has a greasy feeling, the bone has a very hard feeling, it's, it's weaker in, in older people, it's enormously strong in young people, uh, and the tissue qualities change with each different group. So we lose a lot of that as we've gone to more percutaneous and limited open surgery, and we've had to rely on other senses, other interactions to allow us to do the same quality of work and to deliver the same care to patients. Because like some of the comments uh, in the chat from the last um, session, uh, what does it matter it, about the process or the definitions if we're just talking about the results? Um, so there's a lot to argue about there. 
Uh, and I don't have any big answers for you straight out of the, out of the box. Um, we're gonna talk about the available solutions a little bit, um, some obstacles to practical translation of using augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. And then specifically, and, and more to launch you into the next two weeks, what steps can AR help with in my line of work and others as it, it correlates? So this is how things were done way back in the 1990s. This is only 25 years ago. We were defining how to do open surgery. We were defining how to make incisions, where to make the deep incisions, and how to correspond. You can see one of the incisions is transverse, and the other one is vertical, and how that exposure allows us to see some things and inhibit, inhibits some of the visualization that we take for granted. And as we inhibit our visualization, we have to understand even through an open approach where the relative dangerous anatomy is, nerves and blood vessels, because those are very close to where we may be putting plates and screws and trying to help people. We don't want to hurt them. Open surgery was especially problematic in the back of the pelvis. So in this area, and I focus on the pelvis because this is, I think, one of the most consistent and uh, enigmatic areas of the body and the bony anatomy, which appears so well on visual uh, images. Uh, but in the back, where we're always lying down in bed and we're crushing our wounds, these wounds often broke down and had problems. And here you can see how we normally interact with open approaches. We put our fingers in, we, we in, interact with the anatomy, we feel things, we judge distance and depth with uh, the different surfaces of our finger. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell my students, you can feel the tissue, the bone, the, the anatomy on the nail of, of your finger, but you can feel on the pulp of your finger something else. And we interact with the anatomy in open approaches or percutaneous approaches in ways that we can't when we're doing more and more limited approaches. So here you can see clamps that we have to have an incision for that we try to avoid now with our current surgeries. And this transition started to happen when we recognized different anatomical landmarks that we could visualize either under direct visualization in our site or on radiographs. We could pick up different densities on the radiographs, on the fluoroscope to identify where we were and make sure we didn't harm the patients. And so as we got better visualization, better tactile information, better understanding of the 3D anatomy and better visualization, we we're able to go smaller. And here you can see one of the, one of the problems in making this transition as we teach anatomy, Dr. Navab talked a little bit about the magic mirror, but this is how every student in the world is taught anatomy with cadavers. We're taught with real objects, with 3D um, inanimate body parts that have depth and tissue and structure and sound uh, and smell. And uh, we interact with them in the laboratory and we don't learn in the same ways that we're expected to when we're doing percutaneous surgery like you see on the, on the right-hand images, putting screws in through small incisions. So there's obviously a disconnect here with how we need to learn the anatomy um, with depth in a hidden space in the body if we're going to do percutaneous surgery. And it's interesting, if you, if you scan through some of these articles, you'll see that the images become less and less um, uh, emblematic of the problem. And sometimes we have to outline the image. So in the top two images here, you can see that the author has outlined the bone that he wants you to see so that he can understand it better. And in some ways, if you compare your understanding, maybe as a novice between the, in the lower images on the screen and the upper images, you can see what matters on the top images. And maybe that's something that we need to convey a little bit better in order to enhance our visualization. Because bad, bad things can happen. You can see penetration of screws. You can screw, see screws that are backing out or broken, insufficiently applied. So they are, are bound to fail from the moment they go in because they're not in good tissue, good hard dense tissue that you might have otherwise felt or sensed in some way. Percutaneous incisions though have less blood loss potentially, fewer wound complications and maybe less operative time. But there are also some limitations. Can we get things as good as we could have if we had opened the patient up, if we had seen what we needed to see. It also forces us to use indirect ways of visual, visualizing our patients through increased radiation exposure, increased image use, um, CT, X-ray, fluoroscopy, maybe even some contrast, and this can cause problems for the patient too. And nonetheless, we still end up with some limited visualization. It's, it's really inferior to what we could do in almost every circumstance 
through a direct visualized approach. So everyone is always questioning first the safety to our patients and the safety of our results. One of the things that I was preparing this was um, that I thought of was when it, we learn at a certain rate as we do more and more surgeries. You never wanna be the first one to have a surgeon operate on you. And uh, at each time you operate on someone, the expertise, the experience, and the proficiency goes up. But we do we learn at the same rate if we're doing percutaneous surgery where we don't get to visualize directly the tissue, uh, but we only have to rely on external um, textures and contours and their association to the anatomy on x-ray. So do we learn at the same rate or are we learning slower when we do this? Very, very interesting to study in some way. Requirements of percutaneous pelvic surgery. We have to know the anatomy. It's not just something you can hold in your hands like a model anymore. It's something you have to really, really feel and, and feel comfortable with because everything you do through the skin with long tools can be very dangerous to the patient. Uh, we have to have a comprehensive understanding of what's wrong with the tissue. We're taught normal anatomy in the anatomy lab, normal anatomy on x-rays, and we are not usually taught the specific distortion that your patient on the table has. And so you have to understand how is my patient different from what I studied in the textbook, in the laboratory. And there, there's always a difference for your patient on the table. And sometimes we can't get the right intraoperative images. All of us have had to bring a patient to the OR and terminate the operation because we couldn't get the right imaging, unfortunately. So there, there's some significant limitations. Additionally, here you can see that an, the anatomy of our patients is sometimes different. Surgeons of the pelvis would recognize that the sacrum, this backbone in here is, is very different from the average person. The two left to right are different from one another. And uh, how you deal with that in the surgery has to change from what your plan might have been if you expected normal. So pelvic surgeons like myself, we look at the anatomy of this curved bone, it has thin areas and thick areas, and the thick areas are the ones we really want to use to stabilize the bone, stabilize our fractures. And so these tunnels here that Dr. Rout has outlined for us uh, indicate the area we can put screws to stabilize bone, to connect two pieces, a stable piece to an unstable piece, and make that bone solid again across our fracture. So that's the goal of our surgery. And you'll see this image come up over time a few times. To do that, you have to be able to understand which images are required. They're not just up and down and left to right. They often are these oblique images. So here's one and here's the other that really help us to understand which ways we are um, approaching the pelvis and how we have to insert our instruments. And here you can see the corresponding image on the bo bottom left that helps us understand where this wire is in each position. It's aimed in a safe location. Unless you're studying a 3D image or are very familiar with this, you won't feel confident to know that you can proceed with the surgery. Each one of these screws, each one of these corridors has a series of images. And this allows us, the knowledge allows us to put these screws in safe places. Here you can see, this is the fluoroscopy. It's somewhat limited. The, the space of the image that you get is much smaller than the x-ray that we obtain at the end. Here you can see the whole pelvis, a lot more bone to orient yourself. Whereas in the operating room, we have a lot less to visualize and to orient ourselves. Uh, and so we have to understand how can we use this information? Is there enough information for an AI technique to automatically register and automatically define the bone areas that we're operating on? Or do we have to rely on the surgeon and his skill to ensure that we're doing something safely. Other solutions exist, and we've been looking for the right solution for decades. Intraoperative CT requires that we bring in a big machine into the OR usually. There are a few emerging uh, sources of fluoroscopy that also provide a 3D cone beam CT, which really helps us to, to work in the OR effectively. 2D fluoroscopic navigation and 3D navigation as well. But navigation systems are sometimes troubling. Intraoperative CT, here's an early uh, scan that was done, one of the first uses of intraoperative CT. The quality of the image was limited. The visualization is limited. And here you can see this is a child. So we don't wanna keep on repeating x-ray dose to the patient if it's a young person as well. So the, the need to do as good as we can was offset by, well, we don't wanna do as much x-ray as we probably need. So 
um, maybe we won't, we won't use CT so much in this patient. Navigation, I had a bunch of slides and I had to really trim through because it's got really good success in some ways, but really uh, difficult obstacles. It's an improving technology with improving results. It's really done pretty well, but why hasn't it taken off? The evidence doesn't support that it's better. Okay, looking at the final results, it's not better than the average technique. There's a setup time that goes with it. There's a significant cost, often a million dollars of investment from the hospital standpoint. And actually confident, arrogant maybe surgeons say, why would I need that? I, I, I have good results. I don't need something to tell me where to put a screw. So we have to be honest with that in, in assessing what's going on. Here you can see one of my partners, he's operating on a spine and he's looking far away from the operative field so he can use his hands in the operative field to do something good. Uh, hopefully he's able to make that translation, use his imagination. You can see that uh, Stapleton's use of the imagination here is, is the synthesis of the, of the navigation image and what his hands are doing in his brain, bringing it all together and understanding what's, what's actually going on in the 3D space that's a meter from his eyes and his brain. So he's ingesting these images, looking at these. Um, three, this is a pelvic surgery and looking at 2D recon, or sorry, 3D reconstructions in two dimensions, as well as a 3D reconstruction and looking at these and understanding, processing this in his head to make sure he understands what he's actually doing. So this is a surgery that I, I observed and participated in. You can see all of the people involved in the surgery are looking away from the patient. That's got some disorientation. It, it tends to get us away from the environment that we're working in. And there is a disconnect then between our hands and what actually has to be done. Here you can also see that we don't communicate well, even though it's right there in front of our face, we're communicating, we're pointing, no, look at this, a red dot is there, an arrow is there. And this is all to make sure we're all understanding this together. Our imaginations are synchronized because it's not automatic. How we process things. All of us, all of us know people who can think in 3D and others who can't think in 3D. And the people who can't are, are sometimes very um, difficult to, to convey an, an idea to because it makes sense in my mind, but it doesn't to that person. Or it's, it's almost like a different language to convey that 2D idea. So here you, see, you can see that process going on in the OR. Ultimately, we have to highlight things and color them, and make sure they're uh, oriented, but there's still a, an error rate in this. And so navigation isn't perfect. And so we step back in the environment and we look at this and we see all the things that are available to help us understand what's going on in the patient, the patient that no one's looking at. And here you can see there's uh, multiple screens on the walls. There's a CT scanner over here. There's a fluoroscopy unit over here. There's arms hanging from the ceiling. There are lights. And then all over here is the 3D anatomy because we can't step away from that lab. There's a bony model of the pelvis to make sure in the emergency, we can bring the model over and orient ourselves, orient the patient and speak in the same language that we all learned in. So I find this image really fascinating that so much technology really needs to be bul uh, bulwarked by the presence of a 3D model in space. So I love this course. I love this two week experience. I love the collaboration that we take for granted all the time, the ability to work with fascinated and fascinating engineers and people from industry and interested uh, surgeons to understand what's going on. We, we need surgeoneers, people who are really engineers in the operating room to observe from a distance who aren't biased who have uh, neutral ethics, who can say, you're doing something wrong. We need the ability to immerse people. Here you see one of our neurosurgeons talking to the students in engineering and BME to help us understand what the environment is like, just to stand in the operating room that has an MRI and a CT scanner and everything in there. It's really an important thing to understand. Identify areas for improvement, understand our biases, where we're coming from, where we, we have our expertise, also outlines where we have a deficiency as well. And from this, you can see, and you'll see in the next two weeks, solutions come out. You can't help it. Just to be chatting over something and a simple idea will spark into something that's, that's useful for, for this problem that we have. So we have struggles with anatomy, with landmarks, with spatial relationships, trajectories and implementation of our ideas and what we hope to, do, to uh, achieve for our patients. 
Spatial awareness and visualization are ongoing in a surgeon's head during the procedure. So how can we improve that? This is something we take for granted. And Dr. Nawab was, was trying to, was explaining several of the ways that our brain processes ideas, information, sensory input in ways that we are trying to mimic with augmented reality. And there's still several layers of disconnect that we have to uh, get over the hurdle of. It's really fascinating. So Dr. Nawab and I first started working on the CAMC and I don't wanna get into this too much because I know you've talked about it some, but this is really what opened my eyes to what was possible. Synthesizing a, a conglomeration of ideas, sensory input that I was using independently, individual CT, x-ray images, what my hands were doing, visual images, and understanding that we could use everything together to do better work, to orient ourselves in 3D space. This image you understand because of the point clouds, because of the 3D shading, because of the dimensionality of it, that really is much better than a fluoroscop fluoroscopic view, or even, um, uh, you know, just, just a, a 2D image of any kind, really, for that matter. And the more we explored this, the more we realized we could synthesize views that we might not otherwise get. So here you can see an image where we've taken the ideal trajectory for our screw and we've synthesized it in the view so that we could understand how to orient ourselves. And we can orient a line in a way that the fluoroscope couldn't image for us to make sure that we were uh, doing as good a work as we could. And we did better by knowing um, this additional trajectory was okay. I'm sure we studied it. We got some data. But the most fascinating thing here that we found, because a lot of it was, um, was seemed to be obvious, right? We didn't have to take as many x-rays. The dose was therefore lower and it took less time. But one of the most interesting things here is the task load. So this is a NASA index of how we as surgeons process things. And we found that the surgeons who implemented this tool were tasked mentally less in the process. It was more intuitive. It was simpler in our minds. We didn't have to work so hard to understand what was going on. And everyone we talked to about this says, yeah, of course, less dose, less time, better for the patient. But the, the real impact here that's most fascinating is the surgeons were less stressed about what they were doing and understood it better. So now we're, we're taking that and we're taking it to our faces. Right, we're on this technological revolution. Here's my my six year old son when he was three, um, wearing Magic Leap as we got it, and he's he's seeing things. He's interacting in an intuitive way, that just it makes sense to him. I didn't need to tell him where things were in space. His brain processes it, right? And we have to figure out how to intuit that into the operating room, into our space. Now, here's a much older man. Here's one of my sixty year old partners who's using a similar device to understand 3D space and how he could use this in the operating room. And he's much less reluctant to interact with it. He's, you can see almost the hesitance in his hand posture and the, his body posture and his excitement. He's just not as excited as my son was. And he's a little bit more reluctant. And we bring that bias to, to the field that we're operating in. My son wants to engage this, right? Whereas the surgeons thinks, this occludes my field, it's heavy, it's cumbersome, I need attachments, look at that cable. Uh, so we have some obstacles to overcome with the hardware. We also have some bias against software and against the companies that are devising this, unfortunately, because a lot of this image imagination, a lot of this technology and innovation is really about designing for games, for visual spectacular things, right? For, for what can be put in front of your face to really make you say, wow, instead of say, that much, that's easier for me, right? And so this is what it's designed for. That's where the money is in a lot of the situations. And we wanna capture that and use it to good purpose in medicine. When we first brought um, the Google Glass into the OR, that same surgeon who you saw before uh, immediately said, get out, I don't want that in my operating room. My patient hasn't consented to a visual anything of this, this procedure. And so you can't use this in this, uh, this room. And so we have our biases, we have our understandings of what the technology brings and the hesitancy that goes along with it. But there's excitement. There's excitement among surgeons. Don't get me wrong. We are all excited. Everything we show, especially when it's a, a visual headset that we can just put on and interact with both of our hands. I think that's one of the keys. 
Those surgeons say, wow, that's cool. Let me know when you're ready for real use in surgery. They suggest that someone might make some money, but I don't think it's going to be me. That's for sure. But I think some surgeons are still hesitant to give up some autonomy and to trust the instrumentation. And some of that is actually good because the accuracy of these uh, devices is not really there yet. So these are, again, the things we struggle with. But what can we do? What did we start out with? We, we wanted to put the simplest of images in the field of space of our hands to free up our hands and not to look away from the operating field so we wouldn't have to struggle so much. We, we augmented the technology a little bit with some tape. We uh, taped things so they would stay on and, and uh, we visualized the operative field, the fluoroscopic view through a simple get around um, on our, our, our face through this HMD. And I love showing this image because here I am staring at this image, which is projected on the screen up top, but I'm staring at it down here in the operative field and I'm, I'm ingesting that image. I'm taking it in. I'm imagining what its, its reference is to the patient. I'm, I'm understanding where that 2D image is, even though it's not augmented onto the patient. It's just side, side by side. It's not augmented on. It's just putting information closer to me in a usable format. Here I am about to put in a wire and a screw so I can get these screws in safely without making it difficult for me, without adding stress, actually making it easier for myself. And so my team was, was thrilled with the results, right? We put this whole lens on and we said, we can do something powerful because now we have tools. It's not just a limited interactive environment. We're pointing and we're clicking, we're using hand gestures. And here's the new way we can look at our patients and operate in the future. We're going to operate with, with hand gestures in space, using all of our space around us. And this is the future. So you're, I think you're gonna see probably all of these videos played throughout other images. And I don't want to focus too much on any one of them, but I wanna sort of dissect through them a little bit because individually they really pose some very interesting bits of information that have been key to making this information, this information uh, innovation, very, very powerful. So here you can see we're selecting images and we're then tilting the virtual image of the fluoroscope to understand where that image would be, but also how the fluoroscope has to be oriented to take that. Now, this doesn't interact with the patients. It doesn't really help us too much. And you can understand how that might be a learning tool, but think about it one step further. What if we did something like this, where we have someone who can interact with it and really learn and save time and save extra images because we've saved the frustum that, that uh, gives us the optimal image. We're not changing the anatomy. We're just realigning the fluoroscope with the anatomy so we can obtain the same image again. And here you can see the receivers being aligned with the frustum and with the image that was selected in that. And here, you can, after a little bit of time and, and orientation in multiple planes, we're getting this correct. And there's no images taken. This is just a reorientation of the frustum to make sure it's exactly where it was before. Now, ideally, we wouldn't have to do this in a manual way. And there are units that are coming out that will be automized, autom automated in a way that will do this for us. But this will give us the same image over, over, over again. One of the first things that one of our engineers, we'll call them a surgeon years now, came into the OR and said, you take so many x-rays to get just one perfect shot. And, and just this simple technique of augmenting something simple into the operative field can save us tens, hundreds of images, per, perhaps. Here you can see Alec Johnson. He's one of the guys who launched really our successful collaboration with Dr. Nawab. And you can see here what he wanted to know. He wanted to know how many images have I taken? What are the, what's the use of them? Can I choose the ones and can I add them together in space? in a way that the fluoroscope couldn't before. And you can imagine what's going on through his head is something that, that's synthesized. It's brought together all of these images that it's a dozen images in front of him that he would not be able to use individually in the same manner for length, for the alignment of the bone, for an appreciation of the 3D space. There's shading to the image, there's depth. There's also a lot we need to know. We need to bring that down to the operative field. We need to superimpose it into the field. We need to be able to put it in its optimal space and learn where that is. So there's a lot to know. You can see he's focused on this, right? I wanna go back and show it again. There's so much focus on this understanding 
what can be learned from this imagery, this synthesis, uh, if it's right. Here you can see all the images that were taken in, in one uh, case and we're piling them on one after the other. Now the user interface is a little bit clumsy, but here we, we're adding case after case after case, each instance of an image being taken once over the next, over the next, over the next. And here you can see that we're adding all of these in space. It tells us time. It tells us spatial relationships. It tells us the orientation of the fluoroscope. If you need to see something repeated, it will tell you what, what needs to be repeated. And these are things we should have we have the technology to do it. Uh, we just haven't processed it into a, a, a marketable item. Um, so maybe that's something for anyone in industry. And you've seen a little bit of this. This is fascinating. Each one of these builds on the other, understanding how these lines can be oriented. So I'm looking at two frustums. Here there's two uh, almost orthogonal frustums that show exactly what the image would be in that orientation so that I can align the drill in both planes and understand it. And if anyone plays with this technology, they will understand that the depth, the overlay of the real versus the virtual is something extremely hard to, to fix. Here you can see I'm close in these two images. Uh, I'm probably off in a third plane, but it's, it's, it's working to be better. And then finally, this video, you will see, I don't think I've sped it up like uh, Nasir did, you're gonna see frustration, right? You can see problems with user interface um, that really need to be fine-tuned um, at all levels, at the surgeon's level, right? Our learning how to interact with these. I came in not really understanding what, do I, what, are, what is the task? How do, I'm not willing to train myself to use this because I already know how to do it. So I didn't learn all the steps uh, from the HoloLens being ready to, to actually receive these um, hand gestures and understand how to process it, the sequencing, the, the presentation of the films. There's so many things we need to make optimized to make this work for us. Here I am struggling over and over and over again, get the start point, get the end point, um, get the trajectory aligned, aligned so I can do this in space. And this is me struggling. Um, at this point, I had over a dozen years of experience, and here I am trying to orient myself to the HoloLens. If I can speed this up a little bit. Now in space, here I am orienting a real object to that. And it's fascinating. You, and Dr. Navab, I'm sure we'll talk throughout the, the course with how to get around this 3D realignment with frustums that are really not close to one another, but at 90 degrees, how do I get my head to understand the 3D space? I have to move the real object in one plane to get it synthesized and oriented in the other plane as well. And it's a struggle. Uh, there's not enough, enough depth cues. There's not enough information that I'm used to having. And I think because there's no tactile response, I don't get the opportunity with my imagination to reconnect, to reorient. I don't have that tactile response with the tissues. I don't feel the thickness of the skin the ease of penetration through the fat and the muscle and uh, getting this into my hands to reorient my brain, I think is one of the next steps, the haptic feedback that we take for granted in surgery. Here you can see me struggling uh, to make sure that it's okay. I'm tilting my head. This is, this is my view versus what Monsieur was showing before about the outside view looking in just to make sure I'm right. And ultimately everything has to be checked. So in medicine, there is, there is no uh, renegade surgeon like Dr. Navab was talking about, who's willing to destroy a model. In real life, this is a real patient and we are not willing to risk the patient and harm them. So these are ideas that all come out of watching these videos and, and seeing the interactions of people with the new technology, the new interfaces that we have. Ongoing challenges, accuracy and workflow. None of the technology is really oriented and calibrated enough that we can say we are going to use this and be sure without, without duplicating effort to make sure that we are being safe for our patients. The user interfaces need to be uh, improved and trauma specific. Here you can see that there's a, a fracture of this pelvis. If I were to put the screw into the pelvis here where the bone is, it would ultimately exit into the patient's rectum. And that's not a, not a very good thing. 
Um, and then once we move that part, we need to reorient, regather information. And uh, how do we make that easy for ourselves? Continuously updating. Then ultimately, how do we teach the new technology while preserving the underlying concept of the basic surgery? We can't give up the basic surgery. When we did laparoscopic surgery the first time, we always had to understand we might have to open up again. And the incidence of opening the surgery uh, became less and less over time, but it was still necessary to teach that for our students. So do we need to go all the way back to how we're taught? Do we need to go back to basically the hands-on work of learning anatomy or is augmented reality gonna be sufficient? Is there a way to project it where we don't have to study human beings, where we don't have to study real anatomy? I think that's fascinating. I, I, when, when we were doing the work on Magic Mirror, uh, the engagement of everyone who walked by this device was, was 120%. Everyone wanted to see it and make, make, make themselves learn something. So where can AR help? In anatomy, it can help with education. In visualization, we need to improve these things. Outlining critical anatomy. Remember those drawings where the, the x-rays where the, the outlines of the anatomy were drawn. Simplifying imagery with just maybe extracting the data and just showing a line drawing. I've been fascinated with this idea. How cool would it be to not show an x-ray, but a line drawing instead showing trajectories and making the optimal surgery actually happen without visualizing an x-ray. Overlaying imagery, warnings about surgeon error. Oh, this is dangerous, it's going close to an artery. Um, and interaction with anatomic role references during surgery. Maybe we wanna have some kind of um, augmentation of critical structures in the field like you saw earlier. Landmarks, we have to be able to automize, aut automate um, structures, parts of structures, landmarks that are seen either through direct visualization, prominent contours or uh, X-ray findings. Identify corridors, waypoints during surgery. Maybe you wanna have a little map that tells you, okay, well, you've reached point X, now you have to go to point Y, now you go to point Z. Um, that would help us, I think, in some ways. Spatial relationships. You've seen a lot with imaging frustums because that's been a lot of the recent work, but overlays of anatomy and hardware. Some of the ones that we've seen so far and some that we have worked with and tried to optimize really don't give you the sense that we understand the depth by giving that overlay. We don't have it all together, and that's obviously improving. Uh, how to provide safe operations, maybe audible feedback. Uh, you'll hear about that, I'm sure, um, in some of Dr. Navab's uh, musical studies. And then fracture reduction. How do, we, how do we improve fracture reduction to make sure the alignment of the pieces is, is better? The trajectories, the, what I think of when I'm doing percutaneous surgery, understanding what the pathways are for hardware insertion, catheters, instruments, safe and dangerous zones, not just what's, what's okay, but what is optimal, where the tissue quality is best. Think about that. If you could show where the tissue quality of the bone quality was best, that'd be fantastic. Deviations from norm. And then accuracy, accuracy and precision, making sure we're getting things as acceptable, but also as precise. Here we're starting to um, use some augmentation in the OR, spine surgeons. Again, some of the simpler anatomy are starting to use augmetics in the OR to uh, insert screws into the spine in some patients. And it's uh, had a few examples uh, with some success, some frustration, some setup time, and some hurdles that we have to get over. But here we're starting to make some trends happen. We're trying, starting to get beyond that. The in user interfaces have to be optimized, right? We have to look at this and say what works here and what doesn't. And it's not just the surgeons, it's assistants, it's anesthesia, it's everyone, it's students. People need to be able to learn in the same way they're going to use the tools in the future. So uh, hopefully that wasn't too much in, in just a few minutes, but a little bit about the history, why this type of navigation, uh, available solutions, and really how we can help with AR in the future. Um, we've had really great success with our collaborations um, with the engineers who have really held as much or more enthusiasm for improving surgeries through augmented reality, through imaging, through innovation. Um, at Hopkins, with Munich, uh, with others, it's been really fantastic. I enjoyed meeting uh, the students two years ago in Zurich um, and Dr. Farshad, everyone, and, and uh, talking about this. I'm really, I'm gonna miss that this year. I appreciate your learning. Uh, I appreciate your listening. I appreciate your uh, enthusiasm and uh, hopefully working towards some grants and funding in the future. 
uh, bridging that gap and narrowing that gap, bringing us closer with our collaborations and working successfully. Here's my email and here's my cell phone. I'm better by cell phone than email. You can always call me out of the blue and leave a message if I don't answer and I'll get back to you. But uh, I'd love to talk to each one of you about what your ideas are, what your background is and how to make things work. Uh, thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to take a few questions before bringing my kids to school. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the inspiring and interesting talk. Um, we have one question in the chat. Uh, I'm just going to read it. Um, most of the use cases are for the medical experts or students who carry or will carry a professional background. What can medical AR do for normal people, aka potential patients? I think that's a great question. Uh... It's, it, I'll, I'll answer with the magic mirror example. We took a, a magic mirror tool and we were trying to figure out where we should put it. All the students were obviously engaged and uh, felt like the, their ability to learn from it was very interesting. Um, but in, in education, we talk about the knowledge gap and the knowledge gap between what was presented with the current magic mirror compared to the students that we had, the re medical residents, the medical students, was not as high as that between what was presented and the patients. The pa patients really found like they could learn a lot suddenly with instant imaging, you know, constant video, raising the cut, the slice of the image, understanding where their anatomy was, the blood vessels, the muscles, everything. We put it right out in front and this, every patient would walk up and they would play around with it and understand where their body part was that got injured. And often they would point to the thing that was injured and they say, look, this is what I broke right here. This is what hurts me. And uh, it was really cool to see that this could convey information to patients for us, normal people, what I, the closest I get to a normal person, right? Um, I think we can take augmented reality and if you put a headset on and immerse yourself in an environment um, where, where the, the anatomy is portrayed, or you can walk around it in 3D space. Some of the first experiences I had with HoloLens were walking around the hologram of an, a human body and the ability to see it from different angles. And I think that it, as long as we're talking about medicine, this is the best way for a, a normal person who has no medical background to interact with the medical space because it becomes 3D space instead of words and things that are too challenging for them thank you very much um maybe one more question um <clears throat> from the audience are any of these visualization shared between multiple people and headsets in the room uh, with some kind of live multi-user shared interaction be an improvement we did some hip surgeries where we were placing wires into the femur And I was responsible as the responsible surgeon. And Alec Johnson was the student at the time. He was a resident. And I was watching his work. I would, I would be able to see what he was doing, augmented, not augmented, but next to uh, the surgical field. And this was a shared experience. I think any of these presentations can be shared experiences with anyone who's wearing a headset. Uh, much of what Dr. Nawab has shown, much of what was done yesterday, you can project that in a way that can be seen from different viewpoints and with the right technology can have lighting and shading and textures and and contrast that helps you to orient in the way that you perceive it that may be different from the person who's actually interacting thank you um Then I would say, uh, for the sake of time, we continue uh, with the next speaker. Thank you very much for the interesting talk again. Thank you.